Our next speaker this morning is Dr. Joan Walker. She's a research plant ecologist with the USDA Forest Service Southern Research Station in Clemson, South Carolina. She has a degree in biology from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And um, she has been, she started her professional career working in music savannas, the green swamp in North Carolina. She got her feet wetter in the Apalachicola National Forest in Florida and spent one year in Atlanta in Region 8 she f until she found her way to the research unit in Clemson, South Carolina. She studies the population dynamics, breeding system, habitat requirements, and fire effects of rare plants on rare plants in the longleaf pine communities. Specifically, she's worked with McBridea alba, Harperocallis flava, Scutellaria floridana, Echinacea levigata, which is not in the longleaf systems. She's also worked with the Fall Line Sandhills in South Carolina to develop strategies for restoring structure and composition in the ground layer vegetation of altered longleaf pine communities. Sandhills work included evaluating the effects and interactions of mechanical treatments and prescribed fire on mid-story reduction, and describing life histories and the establishment requirements for common sandhills herbs. She's working with others to develop a monitoring strategy for um, RAMS, Allium trichocum, and a model population processes of this and model population processes of the species in the Southern Appalachians. One of her research highlights is a collaborative effort to create a roadmap to recovery for degraded longleaf pine ecosystems or communities. Thank you, Joan, for being here today. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, and thank you all for coming to my talk. I have to feel a little like Alan Weekly, standing here and looking around and seeing people from my past and people from my present and hopefully people from my future um, in, in, in this room. It's, it's really fun. I, and I am especially pleased to come to the Atlanta Botanical Garden. I worked for one year in Atlanta. I got out of Atlanta as fast as I could. And I never got to visit the Atlanta Botanical Garden. I have thought about coming over here from Clemson. It's not that far, but it's really far in terms of culture and traffic. And I, I, and I, and I keep kicking myself because I've known for a long time about the efforts and success in the cultivation of carnivorous plants and bog species, which is, those are places that are near and dear to my heart. It's where I started my research, where I really became a botanist, and where I keep gravitating back toward. When I was asked to come and give this talk, I thought to myself, gosh, I mean, what do I know that anybody would care to hear? And, and I also had, I, I talked to, to Carrie and Joanne and Jenny, and I said, well, I can come and talk, but I'm going to talk about the things I know about. I've tried to give talks about things I don't know about, and they're terrible. And I, so I, I just decided that what I know has to be good enough. And I hope that you'll uh, enjoy or that you'll have some things to think about relative to um, the kinds of research that are needed for, to affect plant conservation and actually maybe how to do it better and what the limitations are. These are some of my favorite southeastern plants and they are listed. Uh, actually, the, the orchid is not, but we can go on from there. I forgot to ask how, oh, works. Um, this is where I'm going with this talk. It's gonna be wandering a little bit, but the first I've called the irresistible allure of Harper's beauty. And I find myself coming back. And when I started to review and think about the things that I've done, I, I keep asking myself, well, why, did I, why do I, I keep going back? I can't say no. And I, I wondered what that's about and what that means in terms of research commitment. And then I wanted to reflect on that story because that was perhaps the most formative part of my, um, interact, my relationship to rare plants and rare plant conservation. And in those topics, I'll talk briefly, touch on partnerships, the need for long-term data, and what I think is a really crucial problem, one that we don't understand, it's gonna be really hard, and, but it may be our greatest challenge and our greatest hope, 
which is to understand the capacity for plant species to evolve and change with climate. Uh, I will bring to you a specific uh, example relative to long-term monitoring for those who, who are mountain aficionados. I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, ramps, Allium trichocum. And uh, finally, a project that's just getting underway, which is a huge partnership, which relates to um, both learning about rates of evolution and potential for the future, as well as so solving a real practical problem related to habitat conservation. So hang on, let's go. Um, Harper's Beauty is a plant that's been mentioned by more than one speaker this week. Um, Alan started it off, and he reminded us about the taxonomy and its relationships. Um, we had a talk yesterday that talked about a partnership that funded a study of the genetics using up-to-date methods. And um, so, but this, I'll just give you a few more pictures. It was listed in part because it has a very restricted distribution. It's limited to three counties in the panhandle of Florida. It's got a rosette of grass-like leaves. It has an inflorescence with a single flower. Flowers in early summer or late spring, more likely. Looks like this, typical lily-ish thing in the family Tophilde ACE. And you can imagine that one of the challenges to doing research on this plant is to identify it within its matrix of grasses and sedges where, where it calls home. And that is part of the reason why most of the monitoring and inventory data to date have been less than perfect or less informative than we might wish because some, the original or early monitoring was related to counting the number of flowering stems. And we had no idea how variable that was from year to year. So um, just, some, I, just some things about individual species. It was found, it was associated, one of the threats that was associated with it was timber management or managing the land. Most of the known populations are on national forests in Florida, the Apalachicola National Forest. It was first listed in 1968, so it's one of those relatively new species. Um, it was listed in 1979, it was described in 68. It was listed in 1979. One of the threats was that was that at the time of listing, it's the most of the plants we knew about were along this roadside. Now this is Florida Highway 65. It's on the way to the beach from some um, populated areas. And it's also the way off, off of the beach in case the hurricane is coming. So there has been, since before it was listed, an ongoing conversation about the need to manage this roadway, to make it bigger, to make it safer, and you add on to that um, so, um, homeland security, and we've got it. it it's, a, it's a threat that continues. Its natural habitat are a, kind of this range of seepage bogs, mostly at the interface between upland pine or and open bog communities where there's active flow of water, and we think that's important, but that points out that we're not even quite sure what the critical habitat factors are for this species why it is where it is. So the recovery plan was written in 1983 by Levester Pendergrass, who was one of, who was the regional botanist in, in the southern region, region eight in Atlanta. At that time, he was really the only plant person and he was, he was called a range scientist, I believe. The only plant person in the regional office or in the southern uh, national forest. Uh, silviculturists will tell you they, of course, are the first ecologists. But um, the, really, the, the really first plant person with those responsibilities was Levester. And it included uh, directions or suggestions for protection, translocation, and recovery activities that were assigned to the Forest Service. One of the, the things that I point out is this need to establish populations off of the roadside to maintain security, to secure this species. And by the time I got there in 1989, uh, working not for Levester, but for the wildlife biologist in the regional, uh, in the, the 
National Forest in Florida office, supervisor's office, um, they had already moved plants from the roadside into three locations in the forest. And that was several years before I got there. And we had one set of records in a folder, a paper folder, and I was able to relocate two of those three populations. And that had to have been less than a decade before I got there. One of those sites was never located. One of the problems was that we didn't have a good habitat model for this species. The type location was in somewhat overgrown tai tai bog, active seepage, and so that's where we planted this plant, not taking into account that the land use history may have already altered what we considered to be the type locality habitat. So one of my uh, claims to fame during my short time in the National Forest in Florida, which was an incredibly formative time for me in terms of understanding uh, the, the politics of conservation and how to get things done when, when there are um, grenades being tossed at you and torpedoes and whatever you could imagine to blow up your efforts. But the first project, the first habitat restoration effort I organized with friends from Florida Natural Areas Inventory we got permission to go in and hand cut all the Thai Thai away from the site where plants had been planted. And that was fondly known as the only clear cut that the botanist ever sanctioned. Uh, I'm proud of that. But it didn't help these plants. They, they faded and they were gone at last count. The one translocation, uh, the other translocation was into a power line, which was actually evolved through time. It was there for uh, decades those plants survived, and it was closer to the native habitat, but it was also not secure. It was right in the line of where, where we drive big vehicles to uh, maintain the power line, and I could not find it in the last couple years. It was down to like two plants anyways. Um, so uh, that was the early years. I got my feet wetter, as I said. I, I learned about conservation and the politics of conservation and the need for information. My first, in fact, my first trip to the National Forest when I moved there was with some of our uh, uh, botanical fans who, who wanted to take me out and show me their best places on the forest. And I was all up for this. This was great for me because I had never been there. And, but my boss, who was concerned about these fans because there was also at that time an active appeal on the Florida plan, the, the, the National Forest Plan. And uh, I was also hired as a planning, I mean, as, a, as an appeal item, so to speak, because all of our appellants, our active community, knew that we had a lot of rare plants and nobody on the staff to take care of them. So in some senses, I was, I was also the, the token botanist and an appeal item. But when I went out there, my, my boss didn't really want to, he says, do you want to go there alone? I said, sure, why not? Um, so we did. Uh, we, my first trip, uh, Melinda Reed uh, showed me plants that she knew practically by name. And this was Harper's Beauty, and that's when I realized how hard it is to find, and I really needed, to, I needed her. Um, we initiated roadside monitoring because that's where we knew that where the plants were. And we had an ongoing strong partnership with uh, the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. Then I moved to Atlanta. And when I moved to Atlanta, there were four botanists in the region. And uh, so we hired some more botanists. I don't know the numbers on that. And I was there for one year. And then I moved to Clemson. I joined... Uh, Fish and uh, Forest Service research work unit that was dedicated to the conservation and the biology of threatened and endangered species. Of course, it was all animals to the date. So again, I was hired as an appeal item. Whenever the research program was reviewed, a lot of people said, you have so many rare plants in the southeast, uh, you, need to, you need to put plants into this research program. So I was, I was it. I was tagged. That, and that made me happy. But when I did that, um, I, I was challenged to say, well, how do you design a research program to address the needs of so many species? And of course, I had Florida on the mind because I'd just come from there. I knew these plants. I had a personal relationship with these plants. And, uh, and so I came up, my plan was actually one approach is to design a plan where you identify model species, species that may be representative of 
core suites of characteristics that you care about, so that if you learn about that species, you may learn about other species. Um, these, I included continuing work on Harper's Beauty in my plan and, and McBridea alba, and at that time, Pinguicula iantha had just been listed. At the same time, McBridea was listed. I learned that, I thought about the kind of research that is done, because I had just moved into this research organization, and this is just a description of um, that was published by Stokes. It's called Pastures Quadrant, and it kind of arrays the types of research on two gradients. One was how much of consideration for use, so applied, how much did that drive the questions versus how much was, what was the importance of fundamental understanding or basic biology. And um, he suggested that it's, there's, there's a gradient. When we're not one camp of, bi of bi biologists or biology that is applied versus basic. But somewhere in between is the quadrant that he called Pasteur's quadrant, because that's how Louis Pasteur sort of, he just, that was how his work was conceived. And it, it was called Use Inspired Basic Research. And I think that's what we do, and I think to a large extent that's the kind of work that is relevant to rare plant conservation. We have a mission, and, uh, but we also have to understand basic biology. During this time, which I think of as, like, I was so excited. I had all these things I could do. And so we started doing some things without, and I had a plan, but again, there was so much to do, and there were so little resources. And uh, both on national forest systems and in the research program, there was no funding earmarked for rare plant work and budgets got worse after that. But I was able to work with students and other partners to address some of these questions about reproductive biology, pollinator syndromes, breeding systems, and demography, the really basic stuff that you think of when you think about plant conservation. Um, so I think of those as the middle years. When I went into research in the decades of the 1990s to the early 2000s, and I was able to do some of those studies, and I also then was also being directed toward habitat restoration. So I, I, that was when this all started to, to build. Um, and meanwhile, back on the forest, in the, on the Apalachicola, they had started to increase growing season fire. Now growing season fire opened up new habitat, and by golly, there was a, a, a hardcore field person there who said, who started walking these seepage areas after they had been burned during the growing season. This was Louise Kern. And she was, at that point, rapidly expanding our understanding of the distribution of Harper's Beauty on that forest. And Louise was not really a strongly trained botanist, but Louise could see Harper's Beauty, and she was strongly motivated. And she hiked miles of, of borders and put dots on maps. So we had advances both in understanding biology and abundance and distribution. And that was all over a period of a decade. And I'll just include this here because we did do, a, this was one of these comparative studies where we, I had selected model species and looked with a partner at the pollinators of these three endangered species. All of them depended on Bumblebees were visitors, but they were only effective pollinators for uh, McBridea alba. We also did a breeding system study of McBridea alba in the garden, and we were fighting off bumblebees. It was awesome. Um, we, uh, we found that the highest diversity of pollinators were associated with Scutellaria floridana, and actually this was an in, is an interesting plant because of these three species, it seems to be the one that's most to closely tied to the timing of fire. And Harper's Beauty had very few, if any, visitors. I mean, the, the, well, there were, they were also bees. Now, the, the unifying thing about this was that across all of these species, the visitor rates were really, really low. And I had an entomologist who knew how to do this kind of work. And one of the things we, that led us to, believe, to think about is, what is the effect of fire? Because we, these were in really well-burned habitats that that frequent fire or how and when fire was applied may also be affecting pollinator, local pollinator um, populations. So it's, it's an example of how something we learned about these plants made us think more broadly about con conservation. 
So what we knew by the end, by the early 90s, we knew uh, we had developed a seed germination protocol with partners. We knew that it was selfing pretty much, or that it was possible. Uh, we knew about it had low visitor pollination pollinators, and perhaps that's okay because it was selfing. Well, seeds were viable. We knew how to get them done. Uh, we did a demography study during that time on um, Harper's Beauty. I mean, well, we had one on Harper's Beauty and, and McBridea, but the Harper's Beauty study was only a three-year study. And we learned that bigger plants made more flowers, the likely to survive is bigger plants. Not too many surprising things, except that by the end of three years, populations were all going down in that short window. And what we attributed that to was, was precipitation, but then we stopped the study. So I'm sorry that we did that. But you know, they're really hard to mark, those little plants. Um, and we, we had used alizyme technology to document that there's virtually no genetic diversity in Harper's Beauty. And meanwhile, back at the forest, that was the growing season story. Um, all of this was captured in the first five-year status report about 26 years after listing. So it was the, the first 26 years after listing was, and, and I think that that is, um, there's, there's no blame to be had, but what, what I was learned about this is that the significance of doing this status report and having someone like Vivian pay so closely attention is that she actually was effective in saying, what do we need to know more of? Because at, at this juncture in time, there was no direction, there was no accountability. And um, it, the, I've thought about that idea of an accountability database that Vivian, or a progress database that Vivian identified. And maybe that's a role that partners can play for each other because it helps us keep an eye on the ball. Um, so I look at what happened after that first assessment as a period of refining information. Um, and we needed, we, there were new methods that came out, and actually new methods can give better information, but you do always have to ask, when is good enough good enough? Or is good enough good enough? Especially in a world where resources are so limited. But follow-up information, we had new studies on genetics, which did reveal clonal structure, which is really interesting. Uh, we did another, uh, this added a modeling component to population, but again, it was only a three-year study on demography. We have increases in inventory and monitoring on the forest, and we're still dealing with that roadside threat problem, um, which was, would be sort of a translocation technology question. But it was an opportunity for me because this nexus of things came together. There was some money that was tucked away in the Department of Transportation that needs to be applied to a good project. Mary Mitiga, who was a liaison with Department of Transportation, said, um, uh, we can, maybe we can use that money. Vivian helped identify what the critical need was, and, and they started looking for someone to do it. And I said, yeah. I couldn't help myself, okay, I'll do it. Um, because again, it was this allure of Harper's Beauty and those habitats. And I've, and I've been thinking about that irresistible allure. And it has to do with first love. You know, it was where I first learned about conservation. And, and I think that's true about a lot of conservation efforts for researchers and policy people and um, managers. It, it has to do, it's, it's an emotional and commitment and uh, it's, it's, I don't want to break it, but I think that's really what it was, besides I love these habitats. Um, but it was identified as an opportunity to uh, perhaps, I had to ask the question, the reason I had it hesitated was I said, well, I don't know, I have to do research. I'm not sure if this qualifies as a research project. Is it something I could report to the Ecological Society of America? That's kind of one of the, the bars. And, and I thought about that for a little bit. I asked the question out loud, and then I said, oh, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyways. Um, because I justified it in, in sort of technology development, technology transfer, and we can perhaps I identify the pitfalls of these processes that are generalizable, that we may be able to ex extend past uh, application to a single species in three counties in Florida. Uh, we. <laughs> we're able to ask questions about 
we, I designed it to, to get information. So that's one of the, the ideas about a, a research project that might, it, you can take a project that may be strictly use oriented and turn it into, apply it in a way and develop it in a way that you can get information that's useful. And so we designed it to ask questions about the timing of translocation, habitat selection, how big the plants need to be, and what size hole do you have to dig? Well, because below ground competition in these dense habitats might be really important. Well, it turns out it got too big of an experiment, so we only used one size of plant. Um, we moved, we had, our source populations were some of the roadside populations, and we moved them into secure habitats. We used, uh, this is an aerial photo, you see this little light green area? That's open habitat between Cypress Strand and Upland Pine. That's good habitat, we thought, for Harper's Beauty. Uh, the source populations were large, and e we could easily get to them. We had to be able to do that. But we selected randomly from along the roadside, and this, we depended on our partners in National Forest to say, where are the highest densities? Where is it? We thought a lot about where can we afford to take these plants from? They also helped us identify appropriate habitat, which we had to coordinate with them because they had ongoing management plans in all these areas. And so all the, the permits and coordinating with fire, uh, we wanted recipient sites that had been recently burned so they wouldn't burn for two to three years because we weren't sure what adding a stress onto transplanting would do to transplanted plants. And at this point, every plant, we, we consider it was a research plant, but still every plant is valuable. Um, so how we did it, we established some protocols we established planting grids in the field so that we knew exactly where we were going to plant plants. We knew exactly how big we were going to dig the holes. Though we dug two sized holes, we did this over two growing seasons. Um, we dug plants of a certain size. Now these are clumps of plants um, that were the size of the, uh, a, a ring cut off the top of a Coke cup, paper Coke. You know, it was a, um, it was recyclable. Uh, and we, we ex excavated, it's about uh, 10 centimeters across, and we, and we dug it about 10 centimeters deep. We kept them cool, we kept them watered overnight. We went to the, to the grid that we had already prepared. We dug a hole, we stuck them in, we tapped them in. We um, labeled them and uh, wished them well. And we watered them once when we set them in. And that was in part just to settle the, the uh, the soil around the roots. We did this with volunteers we had and a lot of partners. And, and we had some results and some surprises and some surprising results. 90% um, survival in three of our four sites, and here are those numbers just percent wise, but you can see one of these sites was a fantastic dramatic failure while we had contrasting success. And what we, this was a different kind of habitat. And we, although we tried our best, with our best understanding of the habitat, to choose sites where these plants would survive, we, we missed it on this one. And, um, but we did learn from that. Now, it was too wet, that habitat was. And it could be that in a really dry year, that might have been the perfect place to put them. That's one of the challenges of needing to do this kind of experiment over through time under different situations. But the size of the hole we dug had no effect. So apparently they were grew slowly enough that competition below ground wasn't limiting them. Habitat did matter. And we found that the timing of moving uh, really depended, what interacted with where we put them. These are the three, three successful uh, grids where we planted them in different locations. And only one did uh, the timing of burning affect the size of the plants, either as counted by the number of leaves or the number of ramets. Um, what surprised me was I was really convinced that just from a horticulture and a gardening perspective, you move perennial plants in the dormant season when they're not active and you minimize shock and then they grow. So I, I thought for sure moving plants in June in full sun environments on the Apalachicola National Forest, these, these plants were doomed. And dang if they didn't grow at least as well or better. And, uh, so and we watered them in once the same way. And it was, it, 
so I don't, that's probably a combination of how slowly the plant grows, how hard it is to, um, well, the, the um, kind of, of ameliorating effect of grasses that provide a little shade because these plants were small. But there, there are some things to learn there about the phenology and the timing of growth in this plant that might affect um, how we would do this in the, in the future. So there's still information. This points to some research that we actually might benefit from. But again, I still ask the question about how much do you have to know, how good is good enough? And we'll come back to that. You know, I selected habitats that wouldn't get burned for two to three years. Three months later, if this habitat was burned, or four months later, and uh, and and they did, actually they did pretty well. Um, the the fires weren't that didn't clearly burn off all of the habitat. This was the habitat where all the plants died. It burned really well, and uh, maybe that had an effect. But we didn't design this to test the fire effect, so we can't. I I can't say too much about that. But it is a critical need, I think, uh, as we go forward about the plant responses to fire, uh, their rates of recovery. Now, the updated uh, demography study that was done during, after the first status review, and then include a population viability analysis, actually suggested, and we found this in our study too, that the plants grow pretty slowly. And the result of that modeling was to say that perhaps they shouldn't be burned every three or four or five years, or three or four years. Uh, but you know, that's, that's, I don't know if that's true or not. We're not sure about that. Um, because some of these habitats can close right over in a really short amount of time. So I think there's more to be known about the, the ability and, and fire requirements, even in a fiery habitat like this whole landscape. Uh, and meanwhile, back at the forest, where managers were really in, in charge of learning about the inventory and the distribution, because they're the ones, they have pretty much the, the world's population of Harper's Beauty is on the National Forest in Florida. And if they don't do it right, everybody's going to know. And, and that's what forest managers take that kind of thing seriously. So, but again, making progress in situations like that really depends on people who are dedicated and committed and care. They also have to be effective interactors on teams. What, what we have an increase during this up until 2015, this is the most recent monitoring data, that they had updated to find reporting to over 200 known locations with at least 20 separated by more than groups of um, one kilometer. And they had set up over 120 monitoring plots, some of them in, most of them in native habitat, and a quarter of them on roadside, which is really important because we're really not, uh, we at that time didn't know where the, the meager amount of genetic diversity which we found, we didn't know how it was distributed. But again, look at this. This is four years worth of data. There's a lot of variability in the number of flowering plants. Um, most of them were, there aren't any evidence of really serious declines. In fact, during this period, most of them were increasing, but there's no statistics on this. So we still have better information, but need more information about the abundance and distribution of this plant. And we really have to be able to figure out, I want that, I want that uh, Spox, um, what was it? That, tricorder so that we can point it and say, yes, that is indeed Harper's Beauty and just count it. Um, but during the process of the translocation process, and we had help, people helping us dig and move plants, uh, we tra I, I helped tried to train people to say, this is what it looks like, this is what it feels like. You know, you'll be one of six people in the world who can pick out Harper's Beauty vegetatively. And it's possible, um, but it's hard. In fact, the first genetic study we did, we had we were, uh, we had one plant that was way off and we figured that it was Tophelia, but we tried really hard. Um, so one of the reasons that um, advances on the forest in terms of inventory and monitoring grew out of an effort to, to target that sampling better and it, to increase our understanding of habitat. 
And so a habitat model based on potential natural vegetation was, a st was created by um, the managers at, in the supervisor's office in Florida. This is a, 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 just a picture of that. In this picture, the wet prairies, which seem to be the preferred habitat of Harbors Beauty, are red. So habitats, this improves the efficiency. And it also gave us an idea, because they could estimate area, of how much potential habitat there was. So this is an ad advance in another part of, of information gathering and technology and research that, that gives us a tool for monitoring and managing that uh, rare plant. On top of that, they in, are very creative and innovative in that office. So I have a lot of respect for them. They uh, also tried to figure out how to use existing information to build a model. They did this with partners uh, that would help us predict not only where the wet prairies were, but what are those conditions of those prairies. So, um, and this is just an example of those different condition classes. So, we've been at conservation and research for 35 years and counting. By uh, Vivian's talk, we should be recovered on average around 30 years of recovery. We're working on it. Those are some of the key things. I, I highlighted the, in yellow the, the documents which actually are, are points that help us stop and look and say where to go next. Um, but we have so much to learn and I, I can't help but wonder a bunch of stuff. Uh, for example, 35 years and it's still endangered. Makes me want to ask the question, what is the meaning of recovery in a world that's changing so fast? And if recovery is removing threats and slowing down the decline or stopping the decline, we can't remove climate change. And that gets to the point of understanding what is really the capacity of these plants to tolerate that? Maybe we don't look at that as a threat at it as anymore. We look at that as the new status quo, that the background is changing. It's like winter. It's just there. And plants adapt or they die. What was that that Barb Crane said yesterday? Uh, or move on. So this gave me pause to, to comment on the importance of partners in doing conservation research. Um, Conservation needs a coordinator or a database, a progress database. And maybe this group can provide some accountability and, uh, to each other. Um, as loss of habitat is the biggest driver of biodiversity, uh, it, it reminds me that we need to link the conservation and, rec and restoration of habitat to the recovery of plants. Um, that I, I think of the success of recovering red cockaded woodpecker, that part of that was that my husband, who used to be the recovery coordinator for red cockaded woodpeckers, tells me that we have all the long leaf fat we have because woodpeckers were there. And I, I have to argue with him, but I, I see his point. And, and we need the awareness and applying not just management and policy, but also research to understanding the questions needed to restore and manage habitats. And the loss driver that we cannot fix is climate change. And so I think we need, this highlights the importance of long-term data sets and understanding year-to-year -year variability and thres thresholds of change. Does it get to a critically low point and it's gone? Um, what is our measure, our safety zone? And finally, I, I think I mentioned the capacity for adaptation, I think, is one of the biggest unknowns but it's also one of our biggest hopes for understanding it. And so I, I think we do need to apply efforts to understanding that. Now, I know I'm almost, I'm, I'm getting close to out of time. I got uh, help. Okay. I think I started a little late, but that's okay. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna skip very quickly through just the nature of some questions. This was a project that was motivated. It's not listed. Allium trichocum or ramps. How many have ever harvested and eaten ramps in the southeast? Yeah. Well, we had our partners come to us and say, our people are concerned about this. I mean, uh, 
we have people saying, I can't find ramps. My granddaddy harvested ramps there. He could just walk off the road, fill a bushel basket, and move on. And, and uh, so this was a partnership with National Forests in North Carolina. And so that motivated the need for a long-term monitoring project. And we embedded into that trying to understand various factors like accessibility and to harvesters and evidence of harvesting activity. So we set it up. Uh, it was particularly interesting because it's at the southern part of the range of this plant. And just a tidbit of information, Allium trichocum was the first plant that was listed in the province of Ontario, and it was listed because it was over-harvested. Um, after five years, we learned that um, most of the plants that showed any heterogeneity through time that bounced around in their population were at low elevations. Elevation was the best predictor of what was happening, and that high elevations, cool sites were protected. So we say, okay, this is, uh, this is going to tell us something about how they're going to survive into the future. Climate change, five years of data. We thought this was pretty good. We remeasured them 10 years later. This just shows the variation among populations. Each of these bars is the mean of 10 years worth of data. Um, the first time we measured it, we had almost half, we had two thirds of the populations that were significantly changing. Here we only had six. Five of them were declining and one of them was increasing. That one that was actually increasing was in one of those protected cool places. But what about the ones that were declining? It wasn't related to elevation anymore, it was related to disturbance, the presence of disturbance. Overall, plants that had a high level of uh, disturbance, frequency of disturbance, had a lower but relatively steady uh, population level through time. The ones where disturbance was less evident based on actual measurements of the abundance of, of, of harvesting uh, were always higher. But these looked like they were pretty stable. But what we looked at here is this shows uh, the, the plots that are ordered from the highest abundance to the lowest abundance. The ones of disturbance. Um, so it's the proportion of transects with disturbance. So these are highly disturbed plots and these are the lowest. Red means they're declining, blue means they're increasing. So now we have this different picture of what's causing patterns of change. And I don't know if it's, so five years difference, two different pictures of what we're seeing. And we do have 15 years worth of data now, and I don't have that prepared. But it's the argument for five years isn't enough, and 10 years might not be. And on top of it all, we started this project right about the time a study came out when 10 years later that said, that's the same year that we started to see increasing temperatures in the Southern Appalachians. And where, so, you know, as baseline data, we had great hope, but who knows. Um, the last project I just want to touch on is a, a project that grew out of the region-wide effort to conserve and restore longleaf pine habitats. It was also associated with a group, not unlike this group, a South Carolina group who identified themselves as partners for plant conservation. Unfortunately, it's been had a little shaky activity since then, but um, there was a problem that we needed uh, reliable and ecologically sound, good seed sources for restoration. When you're taking little blue stem from Texas or Missouri or Minnesota and planting it in South Carolina, there's a good chance it won't survive. But we had this mishmash of policy that says you need to plant warm season grasses and no seed sources were available. And if they were available, no local seed sources, uh, we didn't even know how to start, help producers start growing it because we didn't know what should be the seed transfer guidelines for common species in the longleaf system. A really good way to look at that is to put them all, collect from different populations across the range, put them in a common garden, monitor their performance. So we've taken advantage of this. It's a, at this point a limited geographic study because that's what we had funding for. And, um, and it's also limited to six species in our garden. We have 12 to 15 populations collected in uh, Georgia to up as far north as the Croatan National Forest in North Carolina. I think I have a picture here. Oh, anyways, um, let me just, I'll show you the, the, the collection sites in one second. But 
Histori our previous seed or plant material zones have been based on, placed on, based on climate, like USDA planting zones. There have been proposals that we use ecoregions, which has worked to some degree in the West. But we have, as Alan Weekly's talk pointed out, a rich and complex and deep history that's very different than the Pacific Northwest, where proponents of ecoregions were, were arguing for the use of for ecoregions as seed zones. And we pondered that very question that has come up at a couple different places in this talk. Do patterns of endemism have something to tell us about the genetic diversity and capacity for evolution of the common species? Uh, just raise the question. So we uh, came up with some uh, provisional zones based on a few different lines besides ecoregions, and we investigated this question. Centers of endemism are indicators for potentially significant genetic structure within widespread species. The results of this are, we're just gathering them. It took a while, it was a huge, it's a huge experiment. We had three gardens, six species, 10 to 12 populations, 60 plants, 60 to 100 plants of each population planted. It was, it was huge, and if I had it to do over, I would start with one species, one garden, and I would, but I never did anything like that smart, so we just, we just got it done. Um, we collected over, this, these are the collection locations, we grew them in a greenhouse, we planted them out using fabric cloth to help regulate moisture and competition, and then we measured them. Oops, that was the seed collector. Um, these are, we concentrated on the three major groups uh, that are common to the longleaf system. And to date, in addition to measuring traits, like traits that might predict success in a competitive environment, like height, rate of growth, uh, things that might vary with climate, like uh, phenology of flowering and growth, we also wanted to evaluate the genetic structure in our gardens. So this is, we have preliminary data for Tephrosia. Um, these were the collection areas for Tephrosia. We used genetic by sequencing or GBS methods. And um, this is a PCA ordination that shows where these populations fell out. Three groups, three groups on the landscape. So there is demonstrative differences in places that are, that follow some breaks in ecological patterns. Southern coastal plain, um, north of, um, well, the Middle Atlantic Coastal Plain and Sand Hills. And we hope that understanding and increasing this knowledge of genetic structure will help us both understand past rates of evolution and understand forward into what is the potential capacity for evolution or adaptation. And maybe even like Barb Crane was talking about, where do you get the seeds from if you're gonna do some facilitated migration? So, I would just stop there to say that, and and point out that we do use-inspired research. I love that phrase. And that to support conservation, we need to focus on the plant at various time and spatial scales. But we also have to focus on the environment. And we won't get it done without partners, both within research, but across research management and um, policy. So, thank you. <laughs>